Greetings, friends. My name is Weston Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 at Asian Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. Today, we're going to take a look at yet another round of very weak data out of China and showing that this reopen recovery is losing steam and very quickly at that. Okay, so we have retail sales, industrial production, fixed asset investment, all coming in below expectations. And then bring out the champagne. Japan's broad-based Topix index has hit a new 33-year high of 2127, an absolutely arbitrary figure or date or whatever it is that financial media is celebrating for some reason. So in light of this random number, that was reached on the index. I'm going to share uh, some less than optimistic commentary from the domestic Japanese uh, investor community um, and what those comments in and of themselves say about market behavior in Japan and this sort of huge outperformance that we've been having uh, year to date. Okay, so first, macro data out of China today. Retail sales. 18% year over year, okay? It sounds big, but it's not, considering that we're co we're comping off of when this little village called Shanghai was in lockdown last year. Uh, in fact, the 18% year over year growth in retail sales was actually a big miss from the 22% consensus of expectations. So 18% year over year growth in retail sales was a weak retail sales figure for April. Okay, next we have industrial production, 5.6%. A huge miss from the 10.9% estimates. Okay, then fixed asset investment coming in at 4.7%, which is both a slowdown and a miss of the 5.7 estimates. Okay, uh, we're also seeing this yawning gap between state owned entities investment, which came in at 9.4%, um, in contrast to that of private sector investment at 0.4%. 9.4% for state-owned entities, 0.4% for private sector. That huge divergence, that reflects weak business confidence. We also have a very sharp decline in real estate and property investment. It's down, according to Reuters, down 16%, according to Reuters calculations off of the official data which is a massive drop from the already big drop of 7.2 reading, minus 7.2 reading just last month, okay? So property investment continues to struggle. Now, uh, look, I know I've been throwing China macro data at you, like, a, you know, a, just a ton of it, right? Nonstop over the last week or two. Um, and it can get very confusing and there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of data points, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sum up what we've had so far this month of note. And it's grouped into categories with the aim of just basically, hopefully just painting a kind of a clearer, more organized picture of, of all these figures that I've been talking about. Okay. Uh, now just note that at least for me personally, um, I don't care what the actual data out of what Chinese officials say are. Okay. What I care more about is what they are relative to consensus estimates and expectations. Did they beat? Did they miss? Did they surprise the upside? An unexpected disappointment, you know, downside, you know, among analyst forecasts and expectations. That's what I care about. Uh, you know, the contrast between where the kind of collective mind is, um, even if it's just a, a handful of analysts out there, uh, nonetheless, they're kind of like third party auditors, if you will. So where they are versus where the Chinese officials release is, okay? So uh, I'm going to split them up into just kind of three broad categories. Let's figure out, let's do it this way, um, of for which, you know, China's growth and then therefore global growth hinges on, okay? So category one, we'll just go over kind of the state of the, the bigger picture of, you know, the state of the, the consumer and the domestic demand part of the, of the Chinese economy. And then category two will be kind of the state of manufacturing and industry, right? Factory of the world. And then lastly, number three um, will just be just capital, right? Loans, credit, investment, and the like. Okay. So first we have the consumer economy. That looks as follows. Imports year over year. Big miss. 
consensus was at zero percent. Actual was at minus almost minus eight percent down, um, and that reflects weak domestic demand and lower commodity prices. Then we have CPI year over year down for the third month to basically stand still at 0.1% and far below the 0.4% estimates and the 0.7% previous. This is the lowest print since February of 2021. It seems like China is in deflation. And then finally today we have retail sales. That also, like I said, missed expectations despite being 18.4%. Consensus was at 21%. Okay, so that's the state of the consumer driven demand recovery. Uh, th there doesn't seem to be one. Now, let's move on from the consumer demand driven recovery and take a look at China, the manufacturing powerhouse. First, we have manufacturing PMIs that came in uh, at the beginning of the month for an unexpected contraction to print below 50, 49.5, which was a not just a contraction, but an unexpected one because consensus was uh, at above 50. Okay, so above 50 or below 50, that's the key level, right? Whether or not you're in contraction or expansion. Then we have factory gate prices in just outright deflation, declining for seven months straight, and still the reading was a miss from uh, expectations. Minus 3.6% versus the minus 3.2% consensus. Okay. And then finally, today we have industrial production basically just above half that of the estimate figures. So, okay. So the consensus was at 10.9%. The actual was 5.6%. Okay. So that's how the kind of manufacturing side of the economy looks. Uh, not so dandy. And again, just misses across the board. Okay, so let's just take a look at the sort of capital, um, you know, sector of the economy, if you will. Uh, things like loans, credit, investment, and so on. Okay, so how is financing looking? Well, new loans basically came in uh, the lowest in six months. And the actual print was basically half that the consensus for a huge miss in new loan, um, new loans versus new loan estimates. Okay, so weaker bank loans, um, but how about credit growth? Total social financing. This was also a big miss, um, also at six-month lows. And then fixed asset investment came in today at 4.7%, another miss of estimates at 5.5%. And once again, investment in real estate and property plunged. Okay. Oh, and then we actually did get one more piece of data today. Uh, we got employment figures. We actually saw a slight downtick in unemployment. You know, urban jobless rate ticked down 5.2% uh, in April versus 5.3% in, in March, right? That's that's a good thing, I suppose, right? Uh, oh, but youth unemployment, for, you know, those aged 16 to 24, increased to a record high 20.4% from the 19.6% previous. So we're now in a 20 handle for youth unemployment which makes that downtick in the kind of overall urban jobless rate from 5.3% down to 5.2%. I mean, it makes that look really bad, actually, you know, in, in contrast, right? When you have youth unemployment at a 20 handle and rising, horrendous. So let's put it all together. The manufacturing engine is stalling as well as the consumer demand side of the economy, as well as credit growth and loan demand for you know lack of borrower confidence, as well as weak private sector, fixed investment for lack of business confidence, and a fifth of China's youth is unemployed. Okay, um, let's take a look at markets. And we see Chinese bond yields and the Yuan falling to its year-to-date lows. And so I guess those could have told us all of this, this broader picture. Uh, but you just sum it up all together and we're getting clearly a picture in which reopen recovery that's dead, right? I mean, it's, it's either dead or on its way to death. Uh, if left unchecked, I don't see how that it would just kind of magically improve. And I think that I am certainly not alone here because out now everyone is looking to the PBOC to see what action they will be taking and when in order to support this reopen 
clearly in struggle. They had a chance to do so uh, yesterday, um, but they didn't take much action with their one-year MLF rate unchanged, um, although they did unexpectedly inject liquidity for the sixth month in a row. Okay, So basically, yesterday, PBOC had its one-year medium-term lending facility rate at, what was it, 2.75%, okay? that That's basically left unchanged. That's in line with um, 26 out of 30 economists' predictions. Basically, in China, what this is, the one-year MLF rate, it's basically what the rate at which the PBOC lends to like large commercial banks, and it also acts as sort of a forward guidance, if you will, for what the PBOC's loan prime rate will be. So that's the significance of the MLF rate. Um, and they just left it on change one year MLF, um, again, in line with consensus. Um, however, the PBOC did kind of surprise inject net liquidity into the system uh, for now the sixth month in a row. It added a net 25 billion yuan uh, in its medium term lending facility. And the expectations were that you know, basically eight out of 10 economists were expecting that they would skip the a net injection for the first time this year. Um, but they did not. They added liquidity to the system to the tune of 25 billion yuan more than the amount that was basically being rolled over. That's basically a picture. We just basically have those in the Chinese economy as well as the global economy are looking to the central bank or I guess the central government and the central bank uh, to do something because you know, left unchecked the economy uh, from the consumer angle, from the domestic demand angle, um, for, from the manufacturing side, from what, whatever angle you want to look at it, um, isn't just reopening and recovering on its own, okay? Reopening the world's second largest economy isn't like flicking, you know, a switch, uh, kind of envisioned it to be, but also likely how, you know, a lot of Chinese officials and government probably envisioned it to be um but you know it is not flicking a switch shutting a city down might be flicking a switch but turning it back on i mean it's not it doesn't work that way because china uh, zero code policy i mean th that may have seriously damaged and scarred the collective economic psyche um and if they don't therefore if they don't get the policy prescription mix just perfectly right and this is like even if there is like a, a a path right but if they don't nail that right then indeed it, you know this kind of pessimism and uh in, in just general economic activity any any of these measures retail sales whatever it is right um factory gate all that stuff like it can just become very entrenched just like uh in japan right after the bubble burst and decades of like no recovery, it just kind of the, the permanently scarred the economy. So, um, what Ch China is going to do, what the PBOC is going to do, I have no idea. If they're going to even do anything, and when they're going to do it, and what they are are going to do, uh, I have no idea. But the markets and the real economy, for that matter, is looking at the PBOC and Chinese officials saying, "Okay, balls in your court. Economy is not improving on its own. So do something." Because this is not gonna, this is not fixing itself clearly. Okay, on to Japan. So the broad-based topics index opened today at a 33-year high and held those levels, closing on the highs of the day at 2127, its highest level since August 1990, the bubble levels. Um, I don't know why this is being celebrated or being made such a big deal i guess because it's just you know a, sort of a milestone because of how far back it goes but it's not like that level is anything particularly special that was just on its way declining uh during the the bubble right um and what like i don't know there's no significant significance of this 21 27 level of august of 1990 I, unless I'm missing something. Meanwhile, the Nikkei index, however, at one point today, was just just under 100 points shy of that very pesky 30k level. Though, as I keep saying, 30k print itself is not going to do it. it. It's you know, it's 
hit 30k before printed 30k before but it needs to search clear through 30,000 um 30,000 yen before that next leg of momentum comes okay uh, and in the meantime, I think that the Topics Index can do whatever it wants to, but ultimately it will kind of be held back as long as the Nikkei can even break clean above, you know, 30k. That said, Japan continues to be uh, the outperforming DM region, um, you know, on a global DM basis, okay? Topics year over uh, year to date um, increase is at a little over 12%. Nikkei is up about 14% year to date. Versus the MSCI Asia Pacific Index X Japan that's up two percent on the year, and MSCI World Index is up eight percent. So we have the foreign community bull up, and you know on Japan, and they're basically the ones basically solely responsible for pushing Japan indices to outperform year to date. They're citing easy policy from the BOJ, increases in sort of shareholder returns, if you have buybacks, dividends, strong earnings beats. No perceived uh, imminent recession risk, no banking crisis. Um, and of course, oh yes, the value. Oh, the value. So, um, in light of this topics index hitting this nothing, um, what, what I tried to do today is I wanted to find some genuine, like, contrasting commentary from, like, the domestic institutional investor base. Like, the, I'm not doing this as like a, a bull or anything like that. This is just purely just tr doing what traders should be doing. You're always trying to look for all angles and all arguments, and it doesn't matter if you agree with them inherently or not. You have to know what the thinking of other market participants are and therefore how they're going to behave because that's going to impact the asset markets that you are also sharing a space with, right? So um, I went out looking for that, and uh, it actually wasn't that difficult to find. Um these aren't my own views. This is just what some some here are, are saying um, on the ground. And I think it's interesting, I, if not important to hear, um, and just to be aware of. And I'll just give you my own kind of takeaways of these views afterwards, okay? So first of all, you would think that Japan, you know, being the best performing region year to date with the topics index being back at these, like, very arbitrary, nonetheless, 1990s levels, um, but on strong, like, bottom-up fundamental earnings supported by foreign inflows, you'd think that that would be seen as a good thing, right? But this is Japan. So, of course, rising stock market is causing discomfort amongst Japanese investors who are expressing concerns. And here are some of these concerns around the Japanese equity market strength of late uh, that I came across today, okay? Um, so some people, some, like, Japanese investors are uncomfortable with this, like, unidirectional move in share prices because they feel that it's purely driven by sentiment alone. Um, and so if there's any bit of bad news, sentiment can turn on dime and the gains could be reversed. Uh, you have others pointing out that, like, you know, these sort of overseas momentum, you know, coming in, they're just focused solely on, like, the large cap stocks in Japan. And so the market's like basically concerned that like for these foreign investors, they're looking to buy Japanese stocks, but they're trying to, they're targeting large cap stocks. But meanwhile, small and mid cap stocks, and they're they're just trailing. And indeed, if you you know on a day in which the topics index is hitting these fresh arbitrary thirty three year highs, small cap indices like um, the TSC growth market index is down on the day. Um, you know, point what. 0.38 percent um mother's index also similarly you know just the internals of the market uh the large caps are doing well but the other you know thousands of other smaller stocks that are are not doing so well and so therefore the equity market as a whole is not reflecting the broader you know economic picture in macro picture in japan that warrants this sort of rush of investment flows in and therefore causing concern okay and then lastly the other thing i heard is um china data slowdown that i just went through is not good japan inc by and large needs china to have a strong economy um to be up and running in order for japan to do well um and so this kind of market divergence is like unhealthy and not for reflecting fundamentals and that's about it okay at least at least what i was able to find um in terms of uh, looking for the opposing domestic view now here's just my just kind of very just general thoughts first and foremost obviously don't these don't represent like the Japanese investor as a whole. There's no such thing as a monolith specifically looking for bearish domestic uh, arguments. Um, since we all know the bull case for, for Japan, um, 
maps, but so that that's what I that's what I came across. But like by no means do these represent like all of Japan. That said, it does represent a you know some form of a good cohort of Japanese uh, institutional investors. Okay, because and I really didn't have to look too far to find these, and these were echoed in, in a few different ways. Um, but for someone expressing a bear case or a skeptical view of these like of Japan equities rising as of late, I, I gotta say, like with all due respect, these are fairly weak counterpoints. Um, and I'm not saying this from a bullish or bias or anything like that. Okay, again, I'm just proactively looking for anything out there just as a sentiment check, objectively. Um, but these seem like arguments that are cr uh, like crafted or cherry picked just for the sake of finding any reason to fit a preconceived, you know, non bull stance. Um, and if that is indeed the case, then that actually makes me more bullish on Japan um, after hearing this. Because what it tells me is that, look, if the foreign capital inflows keep coming, right? Um, and I don't know if they will or not, right? But let's just say they do scenario, right? And foreigners push the Nikkei to break clear through 30K and above. Then it means that there's a lot of Japanese investors with a shit ton of firepower who will find themselves horribly misallocated because they'll be, what, overweight, underperform underperforming foreign equities, taking FX risk um, or or hedging, and then therefore underperforming even more so. Um, and then therefore they're underweight, their own home base that's outperforming for the first time in like decades or something. Then they will be forced to rebalance and come in behind the foreign capital longs and buy, start buying Japan equities with Japanese capital repatriated. And that chronology of capital flows matters. It, it's what makes a difference between a sustained period of price appreciation versus just like a quick in and out rally and crash. Okay. If foreign capital comes in and there aren't buyers behind them, then shares go nowhere, and then they dump out and they crash the market. And we've seen that time and time again. But if foreign capital goes long, and then it's backed by the long only domestic capital thereafter, then they both stay long for longer. So the more bearish that you know Japanese institutions are and underweight they are of their own domestic market, and the more bullish flows from foreigners come in and they actually break through to a breakout point and therefore force Japan investors to repatriate back on buy, like that, that's the setup. That's a chronology that, um, that I'd be looking for in terms of flow order. Um, and then on that third point on China weakness equals Japan weakness, I think that that's probably the, maybe the only valid fundamental point, but from a market's perspective, once again, I kind of see it completely opposite because look, let's face it. Stocks don't trade on fundamentals, especially not in China nor in Japan, in their own respective ways, they don't trade on fundamentals, right? They just trade on in and out flows like everything else. So in the given global macro backdrop, like let's say there's like a US or EU based international equity manager looking for Asia exposure. Um, they will allocate overweight Japan at the expense of being underweight China. Or, or they'll be like long Japan, short China if you're like an, a, a fund, right? So it's so it's, it's not going to be necessarily fundamentally based. It'll just be regional allocation based, right? So from an economic perspective, yeah, Japan probably can't boom with an ailing China, and especially simultaneously if there's like a U.S. and EU potential recession. But from a market's perspective, China disappointing on data on whatever means more capital into Japan. Um, in fact. It may even be the capital into Japan in order to play China, right? It's kind of like how people go long the CAC 40, the French index, to play the Chinese consumer, the wealthy Chinese consumer, um, reopen trade, right? It's Japan could be a, a, a proxy in which to play the you know China growth through. Um, but either way, look at as far as the strength in Japan equities is concerned. I'll just keep saying it until it's no longer of immediate relevancy, but the Nikkei 30,000 level is basically everything, okay? Sure, there are single stocks that are breaking out right now. Look at the mega banks off of their earnings. Look at names like, you know, what? It's like today, even Tokyo Electron, Recruit, Hitachi, so many others that are either about to break out or just have been on tear upwards. 
But to get the real long only you know money in and to sustain the rally, we need Nikkei to break through thirty thousand clearly, um, and then see another round of inflows. And until it's until then, it's just kind of a ceiling on the index. Okay. So that's it for me uh, on behalf of BlockWorks Macro. My name is Wes Nakamura. Thank you for uh, following along, and we will see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.